violence and drugs, you can write a thousand books on that here. It's, 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 it's a lot. There's a lot of it here. In Baltimore City, there are about 50% of the fires that we investigate, that we go out on, are intentionally set. Every year in Baltimore City, the 911 calls are increasing. The numbers are getting higher. The 18 medic units are getting busier and busier. And a lot of it is because of the poverty is getting worse and worse. I've been in the city four years, and I've had over 100 shootings where either the patient was deceased upon my arrival or we transported them to the hospital. In the middle of it all is Station 13, located in what's known locally as the Wild West. The firefighters and medics here are among the busiest in the world. Engine 13, turn out, we got a report of a fire on Bennett Place. Report of a fire on Bennett Place. <laughs> My father was a lieutenant in the city fire department for 37 years. Uh, he had tried to talk me for a number of years into coming in, and at first I was reluctant because I didn't think I would like the work. Eventually I took the test, came in, and I think the only regret that I've had since then is that I didn't come in four or five years sooner when I could have. Before I was born, actually, my mother's father died in a basement fire back in 1961. And uh, a lot of people asked my mom if it bothers her having two sons and a husband in the fire department. And she says it doesn't bother her at all, and she doesn't have a gray hair on her body, so I guess I believe her. <laughs> Here, fires broken out in a child's bedroom. <laughs> A lot of people think the job's glamorous. Uh, they see us riding around in a big fire truck, or they have a picture of us you know, going up and down. What they don't see is the middle of summer uh, going to a fire and uh, becoming sick to our stomachs from the heat and humidity because of uh, all the work we're doing. Within four minutes of arriving at the scene, the fire's been extinguished. The flames have already destroyed the bedroom and left serious smoke damage throughout the house. The cause? A child playing with matches. During the overhaul process, the building still has a very high humidity content from the water that we sprayed. We're inside working conditions, you know, maybe 120, 130 degrees. This process can be very tiring. It really takes a lot out of you. I'd be in a fire, fighting a fire. I mean, I'd be, out of, I mean, I'd be gasping, you know, side hurting, getting the cramps and everything. And I see Ted Novak, who's, you know, twice my age. Yeah, he's still going around like there's barely even breathing hard. I'm like, I'm supposed to be the young one here. I'm really supposed to be the one that's in shape here. This summer, 250 Baltimore firefighters were treated for heat exhaustion. 13 were hospitalized. Elsewhere in the city, there's a call out for rescue expert Hoot Gibson and his team, Rescue One. I think what's special about Rescue One is the variety that you get you really see the worst of everything. And that's what makes pretty much this job so exciting. If it's anything that big going on or just anything that's really off the wall, we're gonna be there. Yeah. 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 
They're in the backyard. Hey, he's pinned on the, on the passenger side right there. Okay. Hoot Gibson's speciality is freeing trapped people. The stolen car has crashed and three of the occupants have run away. A fourth man is trapped inside. When we arrive, there are companies already on the scene, maybe a medic unit or an engine company or truck company. It's my first job when I arrive on the scene is to see the overall picture, the way the car is sitting, what it's up against, whether or not electric lines are involved, anything that could be hazardous to any phase of the operation. I assess the situation, I find out where the victim's trapped, how seriously they're injured, and then I have to look around and see what's going on because there's a lot of things that have to take place before the rescue even starts. My senior man grabbed whatever extrication tools I need, and one man will have the spreaders, one man will have the cutters. They'll start cutting the roof. One man will use a saw to cut the windshield out, and every man specifically has a job. Huh? Yeah, that's what I'm going to try. Scotty, let me try spreading it from here. All right, Scotty, let them come on over here. All right? Yeah. got at least three more years, not no day. Can you feel that, Barb? Can you feel that? Scotty, let me have it from here a minute. The stolen car is a brand new, top of the range Mustang. A lot of times now we take the roof off the cars and the reason that being is it's better for stabilizing the patient. All right, got it. It just opens up the whole general area of the vehicle. If they're pinned up under the dash, yeah, it's one less thing you have to work around. You, you remove that and you, you're wide open to, to go ahead. If they're conscious, my relationship with the patient is we try to calm them down first off, let them know that we're there to help them and we're gonna take care of them. A lot of times they're scared to death, of course, because they don't know what's happening. All they know is they're pinned in this vehicle and all they hear are all these people screaming and yelling, and which makes it worse on them. Can you hear me? We're gonna turn you a little to take you out. You just let us do all the work, okay? You just relax and, and you move your feet and all. All right, listen, something's coming up under your butt. There we go. Pick it, pick it up a little, guys. Okay, now look, I'm gonna turn you, okay? Just let us handle it. All right, let's go. I just try to reassure the patient, tell them we're doing everything possible to, to get them out, that it's just going to take some time, but it's got to be done. And, and you'd be surprised that the conscious people work right along with you. Billy, put your legs down for me. You know, when you're a little kid and you see firemen and, and how exciting the job is, every kid when you're younger wants to be a fireman. Well, I kind of never grew out of it. something I've always wanted to do, and uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Across town in the Wild West, Baltimore's busiest fire station is back in business. 13, sick on the street. Being a firefighter in Baltimore City doesn't mean that the only thing we do is fight fires. 50% of our calls are what we term a medic assist. If the medic has a, an extended ETA of five minutes or more, generally they will send out an engine company to get on the scene, stabilize the situation, provide first aid as best we can with the materials we have until the arrival of the medic unit. Medic 4 is one of the busier units in the city. A normal day shift is 10 hours, but we do get held over. Sometimes we get caught on the street because we're so busy that we never get back to, to quarters. We will leave early in the morning to go out on the street and take a call and never see the, the station until it's time to get off. There are a lot of times when we get calls out on the street, we can look at the piece of paper and we tell you who we're going out for and why before we even get to the call. And I'd say nine times out of ten, we're usually right. Oh, Terry again. Terry? How many fives are you doing? 
You need some oxygen. You need to stop calling us four times a day. Four times. We're naked. At least. Oh, I have no medication. That's why I keep getting sick. Chris and Sarah have worked together as a team for two years on Medic 4. Come on, Jerry. I'm on you today. This, uh, the guy we just had is like a regular. We've had him uh, four or five times in the past month alone. Calls in, he's having trouble breathing, like he has asthma or whatever. The medic unit will come, pick him up, take him up to the emergency ward. Once he gets there, walks in the door, turns around, walks right back out again. A couple days later, you get the same kind of call, transport him again. It's like, it's a constant thing with him. That was no emergency. But downtown, there is a potentially serious threat to life. Fire has broken out on the ninth floor of a luxury hotel. Ten fire trucks have responded, and the lifts are out of order. I tried to call too, do you The fire's in a storeroom and they quickly put it out. You want to, you want to get this out of here or what? <laughs> this young employee was first on the scene. Smoke inhalation. Okay, we don't got no O2 up here for you, but we'll get some, all right? Got a medic unit coming for you. First part is the middle of my chest. Six portable to rescue one. I was in this whole hallway. I came out down there and I ran down this hallway. Yeah. And all the smoke was being drawn down that hallway. I ran right through the smoke. Because I had nowhere else to go. You don't have to throw them away anyway. All right, I'm going to get FIB up here. But there's something suspicious. And the senior officer has asked for the FIB, the Fire Investigation Bureau. Because of the large number of arsons in the city, there are eight fire investigation officers working round the clock. Mike Mrozinski is one of them. It's important that he reaches the scene of the fire as soon as possible, before witnesses disappear or evidence is destroyed. Sprinkler system going? No. No. No, that's, that head was, uh, was there. That the one right above no. It. No, no water was here except what we put in. That's why I didn't want to... Uh, that might be like foam and water, you know? Mm -hmm. Some of them were. Yeah. Jimmy, you got this? Jimmy, you got this? I'm Captain Rosinski. I'm with the Fire Investigation Bureau with the Fire Department. Now, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Where were you at when you saw the fire? I was in the shop in my boss's office talking to Chuck on two. Okay. Then I came from the shop down, got on the elevator. I made it to seven on the elevator, and then the elevator took me back to one. At one, I met up with Tim at security. Or no, he was on the second floor stairwell. I ran up those steps and came up the steps back here, which is from, I came up one through five and then six through nine in this back stairwell. But you only encountered smoke here. From this It was drawing the smoke down this way. All right, but you only encountered smoke here. Yeah. Was that Yeah, I couldn't see as soon as I come around this turn. Okay, what did you do then? I continued on down the hallway because they were yelling that they didn't have the key to the doors. And then, like two minutes, or like a minute, Chuck was behind me with the key. So instead of turning around, we just continued all the way up here around this turn to get out of the smoke, because I was already halfway down the hallway. Okay. Nice guy. Do you know where you're going to take Scott? What's your pulse on? Did you open up the door? 99. No. Chuck and, uh, I think it was Chuck, Celio, and Les, because Celio had a fire extinguisher in his hand. You didn't open up the door? No, Chuck opened the door. 
Okay. Because Chuck had the key. Nobody else has any problem with that. Yeah, Occasionally we have trouble with employees in hotels setting fire, especially in storage areas. These areas are usually restricted and locked. So we have to figure out when the last time somebody was in here, if somebody was in here smoking, or if it was intentionally set. Now, the problem with this one is we see that we have matches all over the floor, but that's normal. The hotel provides matches with every room as well as ashtrays. But I don't see any ashtrays that are sold that have been used from uh, cigarette smoking. So what we're gonna do is look for that if we can't find a source of ignition because there's no other source of ignition except the possibility of smoking, then we're going to have to call for the police arson unit to come up and we're going to do a further investigation. Sick on the street again. Didn't I tell you it was him? I knew it was him before we left the station. He said I'm mercy will take mercy. me. Mercy don't want him, nobody I'm wants him. I'm not taking him mercy. I am, I, this is the second time today. Jerry, how, is he actually really barred from these hospitals? He's not barred, not barred. Everybody has thrown you out of the hospital. They're no, tired of taking you. No. This is the only no, hospital. No, 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 no. I was down university. University won't even take you. University and this hospital are together. No, they're not. Jerry, I'm not stupid. Jerry's going to jail this time. Jerry's going to jail this time. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Ching, ching, put your hands behind your back already because you're going to jail. We, we're not taking you anymore. We're tired of it, Jerry. This is ridiculous. Mercy will take you. We are not taking nope. you to Mercy. We will take nope. you to the closest hospital, which is Maryland General, and Maryland General will left, not accept you. When y'all left, I walked, thought I was close enough to go to Mercy. I called for another ambulance. And they wouldn't take they you either. Right You've called in. four times today. I called twice. This is the third time. This is the third. We picked you up once earlier, Jerry. Take the cameras off would y'all please help me? Jerry, you do not take your medicine. They take you to the hospital and you walk out of the hospital because you leave the hospital. Okay. All right. So what do you guys want to do? Nothing. We're going to have them locked up. We get them locked up. I'll have Baltimore City Police Unit respond also. I'll have them come first and I can go ahead and take care of him. This is chronic. This is every day. He calls us every day, three, four times a day. A lot of times I've taken him to the hospital. He'll go to the ha hospital, go to the bathroom, walk right back out of the hospital again. Okay. I don't and do that. The I heck you don't. You were out of the I hospital so fast, we couldn't. You never even made it to the emergency room. We have taken you so many times to the hospital, Jerry, and they throw you out of the hospital. Because you get nasty with them, you get abusive with people, so they just throw you out. That's why nobody will take you. I mean, we have no problem taking you to the hospital, but you won't stay. You get, you go and you gotta go get drunk. You, you leave the hospital, you, you check yourself. Rogers, please. Honey, I'll check you, but I'm telling you what, I know what's going on. It's the same thing that's always going on. You're moving air, Jerry. You're moving air. You don't my lungs have to move. You, know, you, you don't my have to move. Lung, my right lung is open. Okay, you're moving plenty of air. This don't lie. I can hear with this, hon. You're moving air. I'm standing still. That doesn't mean you're still breathing. You know how long it would take me to get to North Avenue from here? You catch a cab, Jerry. Get on a bus. Well, how are you going to pay for the, for the ambulance? It's $250 every time you get in the back of that thing. I have insurance. Oh, you do? You, you have medical assistance. You know, Jerry, there's some poor little woman out there that's having a heart attack. That some kid getting get run to. over by a car, or somebody's getting shot or having a stroke or something, and we're here with you, and we can't go and help them. I mean, you only care about yourself. Are you that selfish? Yeah, I don't either. Okay, could I ask, well, do one of you want to go down and get some air freshener? And out of my top left drawer, and I have masks. No idea what they're Back at the hotel, the fire investigator is lining up his witnesses. Okay, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Your employee that was injured, Mark, Scott Schultz. He told me he was in your office. Is that he true? wasn't in my office. He was out in the shop when the alarm went off. I did see him in the shop. Okay. Do you know when he went into the shop? About two minutes before the alarm came went off. He went in the shop. Yes. And that's on the second floor. 
Now he came up in the elevator. Yeah, as soon as the alarm went off, he was gone. And he went on the elevator? I didn't even have a, get a location yet. Well, how did he didn't have a location when he left? Uh-uh. Hadn't come out yet. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you when you get done with it. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, the person I talked to originally, which I had a little doubts about, even though he was being treated by the medic, seems to be his story didn't sound right to me when he first told it to me. And it seems his story is still a little shaky right now because he entered into the shop room two minutes before the fire. The alarm went off. He heads upstairs right away. They don't even have a place where the fire is at, yet he's headed up in this direction. And it appears that he was around one of two other fires they had in here and helped control them. FIB-7. FIB-7. Dispatch police arson in my location. SGC-1748. Mike Brzezinski, the fire investigator, is having a busy night too. He's being called out to a fire in an empty apartment block. 44 firefighters are already tapping the blaze. Chief Frank, funny seeing you tonight. Mike, how you doing, feller? Where was it see it when you first started? This end, uh, this end was through the, the roof end. and working down here. We burned this off since we've been here. Right, who, uh, get the man. See if we can get a hand line. We'll get up this roof here and, and get over here. We're going to hit it from the other roof? Yeah, we'll get let's, let's, let's stretch up on top here, right? We want to get a line up here. Okay. See if we can get a line from somebody. The way this one looks, we're going to have trouble investigating this one again because it... So the condition of the building is in question at this time. As dawn breaks, the fire is out, but the arson investigation continues. Whoa, there's a big hole in the floor, over to the left. Holes in first floors lead us to be suspect that maybe a flammable could have been used. Well, I'll be. There's a can. Get a picture of that, too. It is my opinion that that fire was intentionally set, and it was used with a flammable liquid to set it. Another 911 emergency for rescue expert Hoot Gibson. This time, a woman's trapped in her car. Hey, Scott. First thing we want to do is take his door off, OK? Get them step chocks. Oh, she's right there with her knees. Scott, knee. I can All see right. her knees. All right. Go ahead and see what you can do there. Oh, holy breath. What happened? Scotty, let me have him from here a minute. Is that on her leg? Can you feel that, Barb? Can you feel that? Hold on. Can you move your feet and all, hunt? Okay. You want to just get a backboard this way? All right. Backboard. Just that yeah. Way. Listen to me. Can you hear me? Oh my boy! All right. We're gonna turn you a little to take you out. You just let us do all the work, okay? You just relax and. Nobody else in the car? Uh, All right, listen, on, something's coming up under your butt. Lift up just a little. There we go. Terry's calling in. Pick it, pick it up a little, guys. That's it. OK, now look, I'm going to turn you. Got her head. OK, just let us handle it. What happened to me? All right, wait a minute, guys. Ready? All right, let's go. I think uh, being a unique company like this, I'm very proud because there are many times when everybody's standing back when it's something very serious and we take care of it and they stand there and look at us. I just find the job very exciting. Hey, Mick, while we got the cutters here, pop that hood for me. Or see if you can get it popped. It's smoking in there. Is it just a... 
Okay, just check out battery. Battery done? Okay. What we found is a lot of drug paraphernalia in the car, a lot of needles and stuff like that. Just pick them up, put them in that bag, and you can throw it in the car. No, don't touch any of that shit. Just anything that's got blood on it that's laying around, just pick up. So what we want to do now is advise our paramedics of that fact because there was a lot of blood and body fluids involved. So uh, for HIV protection and everything else, we just want to make sure that they're aware of it. And anybody that worked on the scene is aware. Is that it, Mick? All right, just wrap it up real good and throw it in the back of the car. Drugs are the scourge of Baltimore. It's estimated that the city's 43,000 illegal drug users spend up to $1.1 billion feeding their drug habits. That's an average of $50 to $75 a day per user. To raise the cash, many turn to crime. Around 85% of all felonies in the city are drug-related. For Chris and Sarah, the Medic 4 team, murders and gang warfare are part of the everyday territory of the job. And a lot of the shootings are not necessary. There, a lot of them are drug related. Um, there's a lot of homicides that are, uh, a lot of them are drug dealers. They shoot each other, they fight over, for whatever reason, who knows. It's unbelievable, some of the things that we get. Truck 16, medic four, unconscious on the street, Lakeview Avenue. A call. Turn out. Just go. Across town, fire is stalking its prey in a family home. A child and her mother wait anxiously while firefighters smash into their home to save the smallest members of their family. You guys are all right. Yeah. Oh, this one likes it. Just sticking his nose right in it. My patience. How's your patience, pal? My patience are all right. Patience are fine. Probably a little smoke inhalation. Yeah. Poor little guy. Wonder where the mom is. Yeah. Probably in there somewhere yet. Probably find her in a corner somewhere. Well, there's three. How many was it? Five. I think there's three down with our medic unit. All right, we told him some of them have some small burns, but for the most part, he's all right. He's in pretty good shape. All right, there's supposed to be another one? Yeah. There's five of them? They're all like this color. Yeah, I know. All right, we'll take another look. Thank you. See if there's one more down there. One more? In that bedroom where those beds were. He was right at the end of the bed, like underneath us. Okay. Yeah. Not that old, are they? Oh, you don't like that? Oh, you're hanging on. You're a feisty one. Just hanging on to everybody. You stay right there, and we'll wrap you up. There we go. Yeah. 
I don't know. This is the ones they gave to me. These are wet. There you go, Ma. Here, I got them. They seem to be okay. I don't, I'm not a veterinarian. There you go. You want a towel to keep them all in? You want to wrap them up in a towel? Yep. There you go. Easy towel. Come on down. We'll, we'll set you up here. Got them? Alright, come on. Come on, let's go over here. Thank you. Uh-huh, no problem. Just another day at work. Absolutely.